Good afternoon. Uh, uh, I want to uh, thank our participants today in this meeting. Uh, this is a, 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 what, one of the best panels we've had so far. I think uh, luminaries in the field of, uh, of uh, shipping uh, and uh, in the equipment side of the uh, uh, equation. I uh, really look forward to uh, hearing from them. And I think this is the fifth of our uh, our continuing meetings on uh, on maritime uh, transportation data, the Maritime Transportation Data Initiative, uh, and uh, we're trying to plow through uh, to find uh, uh, some uniformity in terms of what sort of information should be provided to the shipping public, what sort of data uh, uh, can be used uh, to make the industry more efficient. Uh, uh, again, we've got a great panel today, uh, and I, uh, the participants have been forwarded questions, so we'll jump into those questions. Uh, participants have also forwarded us their bios, uh, which uh, we have circulated, and it'll save us a little time on introductions. Um, these meetings are being recorded and will be posted on the FMC YouTube page and, the, and on the Maritime Transportation Data Ini uh, Initiative webpage which is part of the FMC's website. So I think we're uh, getting very close to uh, launching that. Uh, please, uh, if uh, the participants choose to share something, uh, do it on the, using the share function uh, in order for the public to be able to review this. I'd like to keep these meetings uh, going forward as public as possible. I want uh, everyone to have an opportunity to review uh, the suggestions and the recommendations. Um, I want to point out that this is a live public meeting and only the participants will be able to speak, uh, but we will be posting this meeting on the MTDI uh, webpage for public access, and we uh, encourage public input. You can e us uh, feedback, uh, feedback on data gaps, data needs at maritimedata at fmc.gov. That's our uh, email address. Again, that's maritimedata, all one word, at fmc.gov. Should you choose to sub, uh, submit public feedback, please reference whether it is in reference to an individual meeting or whether it is a general comment. Uh, uh, we will be posting these uh, submitted materials and comments on our webpage. Uh, we cannot post PowerPoints uh, so that we ask the materials be submitted in Word or PDF format. And please do not include any personal personal identifiable information on any submissions to the FMC. We're uh, continuing these meetings every Tuesday at three o'clock uh, leading up uh, to our FMC Transportation Data Initiative Summit this spring. Um, last week, we had an excellent meeting with our BCOs. And if you haven't seen it, please uh, go to our uh, FMC uh, YouTube channel and our webpage. Today, we're hearing a representative of, uh, representatives from some of our nation's uh, chassis providers, IEPs. Uh, I am uh, looking forward to hearing from each participant. Uh, we only have three participants uh, today, so we'll, we'll be a little bit more flex flexible, but I'm trying to adhere to a, a one-hour uh, limitation. And, uh, and so those are some of the procedural things I wanted to bring up. Uh, I wanted to, to, to talk a little bit, though, about uh, the, uh, the critical nature of uh, chassis, uh, the provision of chassis in the United States. Uh, um, uh, the United States is one of the most complex transportation systems in the world. Uh, we have uh, more uh, different elements of interaction uh, than any place I, I can, I can, uh, I, I, that I've experienced. And uh, so, uh, and, the, and the wheels, the chassis that are used uh, are critical to all of them. Uh, it's one of the common elements that are necessary uh, to the intermodal uh, movement from, uh, from terminals uh, to distribution centers, uh, to uh, places where they're doing transloading, uh, to railroad intermodal facilities, and from railroad intermodal facilities or distribution centers uh, to, the next, uh, to the next movement. So, um, so it's, it's, uh, it's unique uh, uh, to the United States what, what's happening uh, and prior to 2004, 2005, it was a really different uh, situation. We used to have uh, the shipping companies uh, uh, themselves owning equipment, uh, chassis. They'd be stored at the port. Uh, they were not really in, in great repair 
there was a lot of safety issues uh, and uh, uh, but but the the situation was the ocean carriers would know that it was their equipment and they could manage it uh, effectively and and uh, it would be used for their their services. Uh, uh, they got out of the market and uh, to the credit of these uh, companies that are are uh, are uh, uh, participating today, uh, they invested in uh, new equipment, updating, uh, putting in uh, safer equipment. But there, there's still challenges on how we manage it because multiple players are involved uh, in the system. And, uh, and efficiency uh, and management is a critical, uh, critical element now uh, in, a, in, a, in an environment where we've seen in incredible increases in the volume of, of trade coming in and congestion uh, uh, in, in some part attributable to uh, and uh, not having adequate uh, uh, equipment in place when we went from a period of uh, very uh, limited uh, cargo because of uh, COVID uh, to, uh, and to just a complete reversal of that uh, in, a, in a span of a very short period of time. Uh, I believe the government needs to do better uh, to support the, uh, the, this industry uh, to make sure uh, that they can maximize uh, their equipment because it is a common uh, equipment that's used by many uh, different players uh, in the industry. Uh, and if they don't have it, uh, cargo doesn't move. So, um, it, and it's, it's very, uh, I've done some uh, studying on this uh, particular industry and uh, we had an intern last year uh, that uh, compiled a notebook on the different uh, uh, structures of the industry throughout uh, the United States. And it was uh, four or five inches by the time we were done. Uh, but uh, one thing it, 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 it showed to me was that uh, once you've seen one port, you've seen one port. And, and that in large part is due to the differences in how different ports handle uh, intermodal transportation uh, through their system. So some of them uh, work together, pooling resources, working with, with, uh, with the three companies that are, are testifying, um, uh, commenting today. Um, and some of them uh, work exclusively with one of these uh, uh, companies, uh, or it could be a combination. Uh, and it changes uh, from place to place. And this includes our intermodal rail terminals. So it is a, a critical uh, part of the supply chain uh, we, we need to pay uh, attention uh, to what's going on here, uh, especially at this uh, point where we're having huge challenges in, in the moving cargo. Uh, so, so this is uh, something that we'll uh, be working with, 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 uh, with the industry on going forward. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, specifically considering the data uh, elements. Uh, I'd like to hear uh, from the participants on what they need in the, in the form of data, uh, when they need uh, information, uh, what, where they are having uh, gaps in information and what sort of information they uh, provide uh, to, their, uh, to the people that they work with. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it to uh, the participants. Uh, we've got uh, uh, three uh, great panelists here. Uh, Ron Widows, a luminary uh, in uh, uh, maritime policy, a uh, longtime executive at American President Lines, uh, uh, now the president and CEO of Flexivan. Uh, Dan Walsh, uh, honorary American uh, uh, from Australia, uh, who's the president and CEO of Track Intermodal. Uh, Mike O'Malley, who's with uh, DCLI, senior vice president, government of, uh, uh, and public relations. He's also been uh, denizen of, of Washington, D.C., and, and done a lot of things with our Department of Transportation. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, your comments today. Um, and Ron, I'm going to let you lead off uh, and, uh, and uh, go ahead and uh, uh, present your observations. Hey, Commissioner, thank you. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the opportunity to participate uh, for myself and uh, my uh, esteemed colleagues uh, in the space. Uh, kind of to one, one of the points that you made, um, yeah, the, you know, uh, ports are different, um, pools, very different models, uh, but the, the participants in the space are uh, very different as well. So we're all somewhat differently situated in the marketplace. 
uh, as an example, my company is about 70% of our assets deployed uh, outside of pools, whether those are private pools or, uh, or gray pools. So, you know, our, our, our model is, is significantly direct with, uh, with customers on a direct basis, right? Uh, you'll find that others in the space are significantly more deployed in pools of, of all varieties. So we all come from a little different place relative to our business model uh, and the capabilities that we bring. Um, I'm going to focus on kind of four uh, key areas from a data standpoint. Um, it's really material in our ability to do what we do for our customers. Uh, and that, uh, that really begins with uh, the, the, the timeliness and quality of forecast, uh, both long range and, and, uh, and, and short term that we receive from our customers. Um, and I think most everybody uh, in the space relative to the exchange of information, uh, the provision of forecast, uh, which allows for demand planning uh, those that we deal with directly, the information is pretty good. The timeliness is pretty good. Um, you know, every, every customer has a different set of capabilities. Uh, so there's some, there's some variation. But we get that information directly from customers uh, in, in, a, uh, in a couple of different forms. Some are more sophisticated uh, than others. Uh, the quality varies, like I say. But generally, getting access to forecasts for what is coming historically has not really been a problem. Uh, what becomes a problem in, in, a, in today's environment is when you've got 100 ships stacked up off of Southern California, uh, being able to forecast when volume is going to flow to be able to develop a demand forecast for a particular point in time becomes uh, a, a challenging process, right? But the completeness, the quality of the forecast that allows us to be able to forecast equipment demand. If it's longer range, that affects how we think about uh, provisioning our assets over time, uh, our ability to acquire uh, assets uh, to, uh, to meet market demand. Of course, I think everybody knows we're in a constrained production environment uh, in terms of, uh, of asset production, which is going to be with us for some period of time. Um, the second component in, in the demand forecast uh, capability uh, and, and the, the, the critical role that that plays in our ability to satisfy customer requirements is, uh, is having a good handle on turn time. Uh, again, historically, uh, that has been um, easier to, uh, to forecast. In an environment today, that's a very uncertain landscape. And we're looking backwards uh, in terms of existing experience as far as turn times and dwell times are concerned. Um, how is that going to play on a go forward basis? Uh, infrastructure that exists from a distribution and warehousing uh, uh, capacity, uh, the challenges that folks have from a labor standpoint, all of those things play into some volatility uh, and challenges in being able to forecast dwell time which is a material component in determining how many assets are required. That's also impacted by the, the inability to have good visibility on when a customer can just return an empty container, right? A pretty simple transaction, which is one of the components that has uh, been uh, uh, impacted from a additional dwell time standpoint, makes it nearly impossible to forecast when assets are gonna be available for the next load because of the individual terminal by terminal practices, carrier by carrier practices, and the lack of visibility or information around that, that allows not only the customer to know when he can get it back, uh, but a provider to be able to make some assessment of asset management requirements and asset requirements on an overall basis, right? So the lack of visibility of that overall picture is one of the components that's made uh, uh, for a pretty uncertain program relative to forecasting uh, demand and the effect that uh, that, that has. Um, third area I'll touch on is uh, is EDI. You know, unfortunately, we live in a world, uh, an imperfect world that is reliant on EDI. Uh, EDI uh -huh. is only as good as the fingers on the keys uh, and uh, the timeliness of that information. Uh, and I think everybody would agree in our space that it's, uh, it's horrid. 
uh, the amount of resources that we have to put to cleaning up the data to get it to the point of being able to do something with it, be able to bill our customers on an accurate basis, be able to have transaction event type data uh, on a more real time basis. Um, this is somewhat affected by the environment that we operate in, particularly from a marine terminal standpoint. There is technology that exists today, is used in different parts of the world that eliminates the need to have fingers on keys uh, that have uh, a habit of uh, making mistakes from time to time. But EDI, the data integrity issues associated with EDI, the amount of resource required to clean that up and the impact that all of that has on asset management and the ability to know what assets uh, are available where uh, is, uh, uh, is a challenge today. Uh, if we could slay the EDI uh, beast, uh, uh, that would be a, a significant improvement. There's issues <coughs> around operating methodology. There's issues around labor practices uh, in, uh, in different places uh, um, throughout the system. Um, other area, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let others uh, comment, uh, the visibility of uh, the use of assets uh, on terminals, whether those are marine terminals or at rail ramps. Uh, there tends to be a little bit of a black hole uh, in terms of the assets that are on facilities, what is available to be used by customers, what is being used by terminal operators for their own uh, particular convenience at, uh, at various points in time. The data and visibility around that uh, and uh, the need to have that in a more fine way uh, is a significant impact, not just on our customers who show up at a facility anticipating uh, a asset being available, but our ability to plan uh, and make, uh, make sure that we've got sufficient resources in place to be able to service that need. So uh, with that, I'll, uh, uh, I'll, I'll let my, uh, my colleagues uh, speak to uh, uh, to other areas of import in our space. Thanks, Ron. Uh, that was great. Uh, very good uh, uh, suggestions, observations. I, I did want to ask one uh, question about uh, EDI versus a uh, a uh, API sort of uh, uh, push active sort of uh, technology. Uh, how much do you think uh, of your data is is coming in EDI versus API? Sort of, uh, if you could give me a rough sort of. Uh, 80, 80, 80, 20, uh, 80, 20, 80 being EDI, uh, it's, uh, it's a beast. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, uh, if the finger on the key isn't right, then the data is not good. Uh, and, uh, and then you're chasing phantom, uh, for some period of time until you're able to clean that up. So okay. a significant amount of the data, right? I mean, we have direct, uh, exchange and direct, uh, connections. Uh, we act as an integrator for, uh, many of our customers uh, that we operate with, uh, but still uh, at some point during that overall conveyance process, it has to get out of a marine terminal uh, and there's an EDI uh, uh, requirement or uh, data that is generated. Uh, and unfortunately the accuracy uh, of that is uh, less than desired. Okay, before we, we, we turn on to the, to the next uh, participant, I wanted to ask uh, one further question. We'll get back into that a little later. I, I have some other questions, but you operate in multiple uh, venues. Um, and so, as, as I said earlier, once you get to one port, you get to one port. Uh, but, but in these places where you have multiple uh, terminals, um, uh, are you getting enough uh, information? I mean, you've got, let's say you're LA Long Beach, you've got you know, 11 terminals there. And, uh, and how do you balance that sort of um, uh, information flow when you have 11 people that are providing you information on some of these sort of, uh, and I would say your infrastructure, um, your assets are a common sort of uh, infrastructure in a lot of places. Uh, it, it's, it's part of a pool, in some cases not, but they, they still have to work together on how they manage uh, uh, chassis resources. What's your interaction levels uh, in general, with someone uh, that's in charge of trying to make decisions on how uh, uh, to, to, to deal with these common issues? Well, the information, the Southern California, as an example, I mean, it's, it's the most complex uh, terminal environment, uh, not just in the US, but uh, in, uh, in you know, 
compared to many places in the world. Uh, the alliance structure has certainly had something to do with that, right? So, you know, some of our larger BCO customers uh, have cargo flowing through every single terminal in Southern California on any, on any given day, right? So the complexity is uh, is off the scale. Uh, you know, the, the data that flows into the pool of pools. Remember, uh, you know, we're, we're not a utility, right? I mean, we're providing, we're providing assets into the pool of pools that is asset requirement to meet our customer, right? We have a customer in the pool of pools. Each IEP is contributing assets for their customers. The data that uh, moves in uh, to the pool of pools is on the collective uh, activity uh, within, uh, within the port, right? So you can understand how that complexity uh, is affected by uh, changes in market share between uh, carrier customers. Uh, the surprise, uh, oh, we have uh, you know, three extra loaders uh, coming in in the next two weeks for a particular uh, for a particular carrier, the pool doesn't provide for that, right? I mean, it is an, an overall amount of assets that was sized based on a requirement that was articulated by a collective of of, uh, of, of users. That is, uh, let let's say, complex, uh, and <laughs> the events that affect that. That uh, you know, if you look back in time, you know, th these are not new problems, of course, right? Alliance yeah. has existed for a long time. Terminal complexity has been there for some time. Uh, it's, it's become exponentially more uh, challenging as those alliances got really, really big. <clears throat> and you have cargo flowing across many terminals. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, it's a huge challenge when the ships are as, as large as they are now with 24,000 TEU ships coming in. I, I did some math one time and uh, 24,000 TEU ship if it uh, started loading and unloading uh, onto trucks, uh, the first truck would be get, getting into Las Vegas by the time the ship was uh, completely uh, unloaded. So uh, that's if what we're talking about. Yeah, if you're a customer and you happen to be the last TEU off the ship, you're waiting a while, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, uh, next we'll go to Dan Walsh. Uh, Dan's uh, expert in the, uh, in the field and uh, we look forward and I would, Thank uh, you for all of the uh, participate. We did a lot of meetings around the country and Dan was always willing to participate. And so I thank you for, for, uh, for that. Well, thank you very much, Commissioner. And um, I thank you again um, on behalf of all the IEP providers and everyone that operates in the space for your leadership um, you know, in recent months and in fact, over many years, but uh, particularly um, you know, when the spotlight has been on us, um, your willingness to engage and collaborate has, has, has always been um, uh, welcomed and appreciated by all of us. And it's great to have the chance to be here again today to participate. So thank you very much. Um, also uh, delighted, obviously, to share the stage with, with our colleagues here. Now, so, um, you know, I thought Ron um, summarised a number of the issues extremely well, and, and I'd like to supplement some of those comments. Um, apologies in advance if there is some areas of overlap. But, you know, the way that I want to uh, go through this is to think about, you know, what are the, the key bits of data that we get at the moment, you know, and then what are the gaps, you know, and, um, you know, and what are some ways that we could actually, you know, get through some of those gaps potentially, you know, so, so that would be the, the course of, of the comments that I'm going to make. So, and, and in terms of what's important to us, you know, there, there are a number of things, but prioritising and in an effort to simplify you know, what I would say is most critical to us is what is the status of our unit? You know, is it idle or is it in use and who's using it? You know, and I mean, uh, the point was made about the number of chassis that exist, you know, on terminals, uh, you know, changes by market. But for example, um, you know, in LA and Long Beach on any given day between, you know, between 16 and 20,000 units are on terminal. You know, and knowing whether they uh, were being used or not and who was using them, um, you know, would be very, very uh, beneficial. Um, and, and at the moment, we rely a lot on the in-gate and the out-gate moves, which are transmitted via EDI. Um, and, and while that information is integral to our business, um, you know, there is some other information that I think uh, could be important if it was provided. And I, I want to touch on, I want to touch on that. So, you know, again, you know, if you think about um, the, the comments that Ron made about forecasting, you know, I think that it, it all starts there. And Commissioner, you and I have had this discussion uh, before, you know, the, the ability to know in advance um, 
you know, what's coming and when, you know, would be um, of immense importance and advantage to the IEPs, in my opinion. You know, um, for the very simple fact that it enables and facilitates a better allocation of, of assets and inventory to demand than we have today. But there are levels of granularity, which I, which I think are, are important there as well. So, you know, and, and, and let me just run through them. So I've talked about the on-terminal status and, and, and you know, I think, um, you know, as I said, you know, are they available? Are they in use and who's using them? That's important. But then there's a level of additional information which would be absolutely fantastic to know. You know, one is whether they're bare and available, whether they're bare and out of stock, you know, um, whether they're mounted or waiting pickup. You know, so there are kind of myriads of degrees of granularity which would help us better understand how the assets are being deployed and whether or not they're being deployed efficiency, efficiently, excuse me, and also whether there are opportunities um, for optimization. So I think that um, you know, the, one of the problems that we've got at the moment, again, is we're using the in-gate and the out-gate data, which is provided by EDI. And, and Ron mentioned it before, you know, the problem with that data is that there's, there's often a you know, very specific difference between what you receive in the data and what's happening physically because there's a lag, you know, the, the information just isn't provided in real time. You know, and then what you have on the side of the IEPs then are you know, dedicated resources which are invested in cleaning up that data you know, and trying to make it more accurate so that it can be used efficiently. Because if you just pumped out what you received, you'd end up in endless disputes and essentially jam it up. You know, so if you come back to the status of the units, I mean, that's obviously critical. And again, you know, that level of additional level of granularity, whether they're mounted out of stock, you know, um, or just bare and available, you know, that would be fantastic. But then I think there's information related to um, the product that is being moved, which would be which would be helpful, right? So, for example, you know, what is the commodity that's in the container? You know, what is the you know the cargo type which is actually in the container, which is um, being allocated towards the unit? Um, another example would be what's a consumption date? You know, so if, if that cargo is coming in, you know, when is it planning to um, be consumed? You know, and, and I can give you an example of why that's relevant in a minute. And then, you know, the shipment profile, is it a drop and pick or is it a stay with? You know, and I know, I know that these are um, terms which are somewhat technical, you know, and, and maybe better understood by those of us that are in the industry, but it's, it's pretty intuitive. You know, is it something where you've just got to, um, you know, uh, stay with the, con with the container and with the product, or is it one where you can just drop the unit off, you know, and then reutilize it and redeploy it? And, and if you go back to my first two comments about, you know, the, the, the commodity and the, and the consumption date, you know, the reason why that's um, relevant is, you know, it enables storage, right? Which means that the, the, the container can be grounded and the unit can be put back into circulation if it's a commodity that has a long shelf life. And one example, which is relevant in that context, which we experienced recently was furniture. You know, we were able to ascertain that the product that was in the, um, in the container was furniture, which obviously is not going to um, expire or age, you know, and, and the container could be moved and then the asset could be put in back into circulation. And I mean, it sounds like a simplistic example in one sense, but if you think about all the products that have those characteristics that are moved into the ports where that level of um, information is not known, um, then you can also reasonably draw an assumption that the units that are under that um, particular product are treated the same as if they're under a fast moving consumer good or even a perishable um, and are tied up in the supply chain. So, you know, having visibility of that sort of information would allow greater optimization of the units um, and more targeted storage um, in line with planned consumption, uh, in my opinion, which I think would be um, which would be important. And, and you know, I categorize all of those things under the broad topic of prioritization. You know, so um, what are the products that absolutely need to be delivered to the BCO location so that they can be put on the shelf and sold? And what are the ones that can be stored or what are the ones that can be delayed? And, you know, why do we treat all the products the same when the characteristics of the products are not the same? You know, and the answer to that, um, or the visibility that we require uh, to manage that, in my opinion, lies lies embedded in the data. So, you know, how does how does the the data get better? And I mean, I think that um, you know, <laughs> there's a, there's um, there's a number of things that we can do, and and I'm trying not to just um, 
envisaged that I had a magic wand where I could just wave it and everything would be perfect, you know, but in the spirit of kind of thinking big, you know, I'll put a couple of things out there, you know what I mean? And, and, and Ron, I thought again, touched on it really well. It's the gap between the system and the actual, right? So, you know, if you look in our system, full transparency right now, it'll tell you that we have a number of units, you know, in a, in a particular location and that's uh, driven by gate in and gate out. You know, I respectfully suggest that's in many cases the same situation for my colleagues. But if you went out and did a physical count, you'd find a variance, right? And it's because the information that's being transmitted is not in real time. You know, and, and if you then think about the fact that that forms the base data, which tr triggers your allocations, you know, then by definition, you're going to run into some challenges, you know, where you'll be sending drivers to locations where you think they're units and they're, there are units available and they're not, you know, um, uh, and, and not sending them to locations where potentially there are. And then, you know, uh, to the earlier point about the level of granularity, you could get there and find that there are units, but they're out of stock or they're, you know, they're in a different category to what what's can be utilised. And one of the things, and Commissioner, I know you've led on this, which is of interest is, um, you know, is, is GPS. You know, is that something which would be, you know, of assistance um, in terms of providing more real-time, you know, information? I don't know the answer to that, um, but I certainly think that it's a topic that's worth exploring. And, and I know, um, you know, all my colleagues in the industry here, you know, appreciate your leadership on that and have a very open mind about participating you know, in that work that, that you've been driving, but something that gives, you know, a greater proximity between the real time reality and the data that's being provided with respect to the availability and the location of units, um, I think would be, would be um, massive. And I think potentially, um, you know, GPS could help with that. There's also, you know, some, some ancillary benefits, you know, load to weight, um, sensors, tampering monitors, you know, we know that's been a problem. We've seen the stuff in the press about, you know, the, the um, you know, when this product's moving slowly, it's being, um, you know, attacked for want of a better word and being pilfered, you know, and I think that's very, very important, you know, that we have security um, of product that's moving around. Um, you know, time monitoring, again, is another one, which is a, which is a relevant safe, safety issue, you know, geofencing, history, all the rest of it. So, you know, I'm not saying that it's a panacea, but I certainly think that it's an option that's worth exploring in the context of um, trying to bridge the gap between the data that's provided um, and the real time reality um, that it's meant to be reporting on. So I, I would just pause there, um, Commissioner, and, and, and allow the uh, conversation to continue, but they're my initial thoughts. Well, well, thanks, Dan. That's uh, a very interesting comments. Uh, we, we've spoken about this before. And uh, uh, the one uh, uh, issue I did want to, before uh, Mike goes on, uh, wanted to talk about a little bit was the uh, cargo. And then I hadn't really thought of the, uh, my inclination was that we needed to stay away from data uh, that related to content. Um, uh, because of all the competitive issues and, and issues that I knew would come up. But, but I, I take it you're talking about uh, being able to identify not uh, the cargo contents per se, but uh, the status uh, of, of need, uh, uh, for instance, their perishables or something it's, like that. So, so now you're not talking, hey, I need to know whether or not this is something that's uh, a drug manufacturer. Has, recording has, in has, progress. Has, no, no, completely right, Commissioner. And, um, you know, my, my primary assumption is the following, and I'm happy to I'd be delighted to be proven wrong on it, but the product that comes off the, the ocean liners in many cases is treated as if it's identical. It is not. Mm -hmm. you know, and, yeah. and, and I don't need to know the contents of every single TEU, but if there's something that can be parked up compared to the, something that needs to be consumed in the next seven days, you know, I think that could lead to a more efficient deployment of the units that are required to move that product around. So sort of a tagging program. We, we're having an issue right now with healthcare products, uh, uh, testing kits, uh, uh, stuff used at hospitals and identifying it through the, the common, uh, we, we tend to uh, treat all com uh, commerce uh, in the maritime side as general cargo, uh, but, but there may be a need uh, to, to identify it, and we're working with the ports in LA, Long Beach, and, and New York, Savannah, right now, to to come up with a mechanism. But but that's a good point. I, I really like that there might be a, a need 
for you to identify, um, uh, you know, something that needs to be tagged so you can uh, be responsive to that um, and get uh, assets where they need to be. So uh, we'll, I'll, I'll come back uh, to, to you and, and, and uh, Ron, but I want to turn it over to, to Mike uh, O'Malley. Uh, Mike, thanks uh, for being in uh, and thanks for all your input uh, all through the process uh, of this and, uh, uh, and, and meeting with us on multiple times, uh, occasions um, and uh, convey our, our, uh, our felicitations to, uh, to uh, Bill or our, our that wish that he could be here, but uh, you're a good uh, uh, a stand in. So go ahead and, and, and start. Thanks very much, Commissioner. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here on behalf of DCLI and, uh, and, and the opportunity to share our views on things. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, I try not to overlap too much with what uh, Ron and Dan have covered. They certainly have covered a lot of the landscape. Uh, but also talk a little bit about kind of the industry and, and sort of our perspectives on how you all might think about these things as you go through this process. Uh, you mentioned, Commissioner, how much has changed in this industry over a relatively short period of time. Uh, I think, you know, the, the benefits of that change are the investments that have been made by our companies, uh, you know, $2 billion for our company over the last 10 years. And that certainly has translated into improvements in quality and safety and those sorts of things. Uh, but it's far from perfect, and I think, you know, we're very much interested in looking to work with you all on ways to improve. Um, a little bit of background about DCLI. So we uh, provide intermodal chassis both in the domestic and marine markets. And for the marine side, there are 450 different locations, start-stop start, stop locations, where you can pick up or drop off one of our uh, chassis. And that's everything from marine or rail terminals, equipment depots, repair facilities, et cetera. Uh, and really in every major intermodal market in the U.S. Um, certainly commend you all for taking this, this on and, and you know, having good data is critical to operate in any business, but particularly when you talk about the supply chain with all the different players involved in this uh, ballet, if you will. Um, a couple things I would sort of emphasize up front on, you know, as you all think about this. One, you mentioned it, the differences between ports. Um, and you know you have differences in terms of operating or landlord, number of terminals, et cetera. Uh, and I think you know a key thing would be maintaining some flexibility, whatever you come up with, so that it could be kind of tailored to you know regional needs, um, potentially something like you know setting minimum standards and expectations, but giving some flexibility for the market to kind of work in ways that tailors it specifically to uh, individual places. I think that's really critical both for us and for our customers. Um, and then I think second, and, and, and Ron touched on this a little bit, you know, th there are probably about half roughly of chassis in the US are in, uh, you know, daily rental chassis pools. Uh, the rest are in private pools, trucker owned or controlled chassis. And so I think as you go through this, it's also important to make sure that you're kind of capturing uh, the waterfront holistically and making sure that those chassis are incorporated into anything you come up with as part of this process. Um, so talking a little bit about data elements and gaps, I think I, I'm gonna go through and I, we use LA Long Beach as kind of the template for this, but you know, what is the kind of data we're looking for? Um, and, and a lot of this we get, um, you know, but certainly there are, there are some gaps. I, you know, things like inbound forecasts by line and by terminal, and also ideally understanding what's local, what's IPI, what's moving on dock rail, you know, that, that can make a big difference too in terms of chassis and what we need to do to serve the customers. Uh, the EDI transaction and gate information, stevedoring schedules, terminal inventory. I mean, Dan talked a little bit about terminal inventory and I think particularly in a place like LA Long Beach, uh, the accuracy of that data has been a real challenge at times. Um, and then also, you know, things like terminal operating systems, uh, OCR data, which really helps us, you know, kind of compare what we get with EDI and make sure we're as accurate as possible when we're billing customers. Um, when I think about gaps and, and, and in talking to our team, I think there are kind of two things we would talk about. One is the accuracy of the data. Um, that really, it's not so much a, a question of volume, it's more, is it accurate? Is it timely? Can we use it effectively? And I think Ron certainly covered that um, you know, very, very well. And then secondly, it's, it's you know, the, the the changes that happen, particularly in an environment like today, once you know the containers get to the port, 
what's happening to them. So, you know, it depends on, you know, the vessel schedule. Are they using a different terminal perhaps than they thought they were when they, when they started out? I mean, all of those changes that happen as cargo gets closer to the U.S., I think is where the, the, that would be kind of where we would emphasize you all focus on how can we improve data transparency and sharing among the various parties because that's where things can get difficult. Um, in terms of data, you know, how we get our data, I think very similar to our, our counterparts here, very much uh, EDI heavy. Uh, there's certainly some use of API and other things, uh, but I think that's generally speaking the way we get our data today. Uh, we do have a proprietary system where we, we, we use that data, we uh, blend it with some other uh, information and, and then present it to our customers in a variety of different ways, sort of tailoring it to their individual needs. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's just the way the markets work, but I think certainly the more you can standardize uh, going forward in, in what people are looking for, uh, probably the better off we're going to be. Um, and then, you know, just a little bit about flavor for, you know, if you're a customer, how do you get data from DCLI? So we publish our data on availability on our website. We update it three times a day for each of the locations around the country. So there is a lot of transparency in terms of what we have available, what the daily publish rates are, et cetera. Um, and that's something you know, we've improved on over time and certainly plan to continue to, to improve on going forward. Um, in closing, I think I'd just point to a couple of things. You know, one is there was a lot that went into the Fact Finding 29 uh, effort, particularly focusing on LA and New York. Um, you know, certainly we would say you know, if we're successful in this initiative, a lot of the things that you all pointed to, like dual transactions and improving export uh, early receiving dates, all of those things can be improved through this process. So I think it's certainly time well spent. Um, and then I think, you know, just generally speaking, um, you know, focusing on what we're doing in this, in this element versus trying to sort of dictate or change, uh, you know, how things are done and how we're managing pools is certainly going to be a good thing going forward. So I think with that, I'll stop there and, and happy to answer any questions uh, you may have. Uh, thanks, Mike. That was uh, great as well. Uh, all three of the participants really did a great job uh, outlining the challenge and, and also uh, potential uh, areas uh, where we can improve. improve. Uh, I did want to talk to you about uh, the trend of, um, of uh, the industry in terms of uh, uh, of you controlling uh, the assets themselves through pools or, or your own uh, company and, and, and leasing uh, uh, and leasing directly to uh, private uh, uh, companies who control the assets and, and also who, who directly uh, purchase their own equipment. What's the balance there? What's the challenge with with, uh, you know, there's basically four methods of, of operation that I, that I can tell um, uh, that all have variants. I would expect that probably most of the chassis are under the control uh, of uh, or owned uh, by your companies and, and others that are in the business of this. But what's what's the uh, where's the landmines there and what's the what's the impact on, on data flow of of uh, the multiple operating uh, 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 potentialities there. Uh, if you'd like, I could go ahead and start. Um, yeah, I mean, there's been a trend uh, over time, uh, you know, uh, trucker owned assets, you know, whether they own them or they're leasing them directly uh, has, uh, has grown and, and, uh, and continues to. Um, BCOs, uh, particularly those that are larger, um, particularly in the retail space, uh, have tended to begin to migrate to more direct uh, control uh, of uh, the, uh, the availability of the asset uh, and not rely as much on pools. So, I mean, you see a pool of pools in Southern California as an example, uh, which has shrunk over time, while the overall uh, asset base uh, in the region has increased, right? Uh, whether it's through companies like mine that is uh, heavily deployed in, uh, you know, uh, directly with customers, uh, truckers who have, uh, uh, who have uh, acquired assets uh, themselves. Uh, and, uh, and that trend uh, seems to be continuing. 
So with respect to that, Ron, uh, what would you say? Uh, I know it's difficult to, uh, but I presume even if, uh, if you're providing uh, chassis to a particular company, you sort of have an idea of, uh, or potentially could have an idea of where and how they're being utilized uh, or not. Uh, uh, are, are the only ones that you're sort of controlling and managing are those that are in the pool or that you're providing directly uh, uh, on sort of a more daily basis to, to, to companies? Uh, well, we're, 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 we're managing the assets uh, for okay. the vast majority uh, of the assets that we're providing. I mean, there are some assets that are out on, uh, you know, long-term leases to uh, to customers, where they're they're managing the asset, they're maintaining the asset themselves, you know, a, a net lease, if you will. Uh, but uh, the vast majority of the assets that we have are operating in products, in retail products that are not that, uh, where we're managing the asset and the availability, um, uh, in addition to what's uh, what's in the pools. Uh, I, I think the others are, are, are probably similarly yeah. uh, involved in a, this, you know, the same, the, the very same kind of activities. So, uh, so I've won, this is a question I have for all three of you. Um, uh, you early on in the process, when when uh, when congestion uh, arose, it uh, in, in talking to you and in industry, we we went from uh, ports that were twenty and thirty percent down. And a lot of uh, assets were being repaired or redeployed because we really sort of anticipated that Chinese manufacturing would drive um, would drive uh, uh, the market away 20 30 percent again uh, reductions and then uh, by June May June we've gone 20 or 30 percent up the economy completely uh, changed and we were caught uh, slow both with respect to uh, intermodal uh, chassis and uh, containers uh, as well uh, in terms of just having enough equipment for this incredible uh, swing and then a surge. Uh, and, uh, and I think, uh, I think it was Ron, you, you, you talked about it a little bit. Uh, uh, you have contracts with uh, Marine terminals. They have their own equip equipment for moving things around on their terminals. Um, and there was some evidence, I, I would say, that that perhaps this equipment was not al always being used. That uh, it was there, it was on a terminal, it was resting uh, just because it wasn't needed. But managing uh, efficiently these assets is 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 part of the problem that we face. And so, uh, and and Dan, I think you talked about the GPS, and it's my position we have to get to a point, given the critical nature of of the of the wheels uh, and the movement of cargo for all elements you know for rail uh, and and in the United States we do so much transloading so cargo comes here in a 40 foot container and we take it out of the port and put it in a 53 foot container uh, for some unforsaken reason um, uh, but that means you have to have more wheels to do all this uh, more chassis so, uh, so my my view is that that we need to get to a point where we can we can uh, actively manage it more than just gate movements per se. Um, so, uh, GPS, what's your sense on the technology there and the ability to monitor more effectively? Uh, with I know you all have some uh, some equipment that's by GPS. Uh, 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 established, but I just had your, wanted to get your thoughts on where we are in that, in the process of being able to assess where the equipment is on uh, on a, uh, a, a no a moment's notice as opposed to uh, uh, through a, a portal. Uh, I could jump in there first of all, um, Commissioner. Look, I mean, we have an open mind on it. I don't think the, the, the capability has been definitively proven, you know, but I don't think that it's been shown um, not to have the potential to work either. You know, so I, I you know, our approach and, uh, you know, as part of the industry, and the, you know, certainly I'm, I'm sure it's the case for my colleagues as well here is, you know, whatever, if there's an opportunity to improve this stuff through the utilisation of new technology, then we're wide open. Um, to, to working with you on that. And, and you, again, you know, I mean it when I say that your leadership has been appreciated by all of us. You know, I, I think, yeah. the, the, you know, if you look at GPS 
I'm old enough to remember RFID, you know, when that was going to be the, right. the, and then everyone worked out how much the readers cost, you know, and I can remember, you know, talking to customers and them just saying, well, you know, where's the value, you know, um, because we, we don't quite see it. I think now that we've experienced a situation where, you know, the assets have been tied up, you know, I, you know, we could debate over a beer sometime whether there are enough chassis or not or whether they're just being held up in various parts of the supply right. chain you know, and just not moving with the requisite fluidity to ensure everything that happens, you know, if they're stuck outside a warehouse in Arkansas or, you know, being, you know, um, you know, under boxes on, you know, at PRS in LA Long Beach, you know, that, that doesn't mean there's not enough. It just means that they're not moving the right way. And I think if GPS could help, you know, with um, greasing the wheels, you know, so, so to speak, so that you had visibility and say, well, what are they doing over there? They've been sitting there for ages under boxes. Like, let's get them into circulation and getting them moving. You know, yeah. that could help. I think one of the things that, you know, I've heard you talk about before is commonality of language. You know, I mean, I think that you mentioned before that there are multiple participants, there are multiple models. Um, you know, the way perhaps the simplifying that complexity is, is ensuring that everyone uses the same terminology when they're talking about assets and they're talking about the, the units of data that move through the system. Yeah, no, I, we, uh, and you made a good point about uh, not only do you need to know where the equipment is, but what its status is. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit more. And I'm interested in, in your, and we'll probably talk uh, again further about the state of technology here on GPS. And, and you had some questions on whether what whether it's not there. And uh, uh, Mike, uh, you uh, talked about uh, the need to, to be flexible in whatever we're looking at to allow the, the industry uh, to, to, to come up with uh, technology to address uh, data, uh, greater uh, transparency of data uh, uh, movement and uh, and um, and I and I, I I agree with that completely and it, and it goes back to every port's different you know what you need in Boston is going to be completely different from what you need in Seattle Tacoma um, and so you have to have the uh, flexibility uh, but I did want to ask uh, you know and we are looking more uh, generally at uh, data standards uh, and and terminology lexicon. Uh, what sort of status information should be provided, uh, the timeliness of it. Those are the things we're really interested in. So, so to the extent that when we're done, you have further thoughts on any of these, uh, um, uh, that, that would be uh, uh, worthwhile. But now, Mike, let's say we, we, we come up with stand, standards. It's still going to require your company to deal with each port on a port-by-port -port basis uh, as you go through the process. Is that itself... Uh, uh, a detriment to 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 uh, to, to doing it, uh, uh, having a, a, a minimum standard sort of approach uh, uh, to data, or, or 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 not. What's your thoughts? I mean, I think at the end of the day, minimum standard is going to be helpful, uh, right? In terms of you know just being able to deal with things in a consistent way. You know, one of the things as the industry has evolved and our companies have bought these assets, we've created you know pretty robust back office systems, logistics capabilities that have helped us reposition assets into different markets over the course of the pandemic. And that has really helped a lot. And, you know, just, you know, we're probably, you know, on average chassis on the street, 70, 80% higher than we were pre COVID. So, you know, our teams have stepped up in a big way. Some of that's bringing on new assets. A lot of it is reducing our out of service levels to all time lows and really working very, very closely with our suppliers to do that. So, you know, I think all of that, you know, has been very important. Um, the other thing, just going back to your, your sort of earlier question about GPS, I think one of the things that it, it's not only the technology itself and is it, you know, is it, is it tough enough to, to handle the outdoors and everything that goes with being on a chassis, but also, you know, is there a return? And sometimes that's going to depend on how it's being used. And so, you know, when we talk to, whether it's motor carriers or, uh, BCOs, et cetera, you know, a lot of times they're looking at what's my base need for my fleet. And then I may rely on the pool for, you know, everything over and above that. And they may have different thoughts on, do I need GPS for that base fleet? And maybe I do or don't for the pool. So I think that, you know, all of those kinds of factors as customers look at how they want to use chassis and how they want to pay for them and invest in them is really important. And obviously, you know, we're a partner with all of them across the board. 
So Ron, uh, you talked about forecasting challenges and one of the issues that I see is problematic uh, is that uh, the IEPs uh, are not part of the, <clears throat> agree the, the agreement process itself. So you, you have three alliances, uh, they're transporting the vast, vast majority of cargo coming in. You know, you might have a ship with uh, five different steamship lines uh, container boxes on it. It's you know twenty thousand TEUs, um, and and so uh, and right now there might be an agreement with the uh, marine terminals and and uh, and the uh, and the uh, and the, uh, the lines themselves about uh, you know how the alliance would uh, use a pool per se, uh, but but but. Uh, that should seem to be a mechanism also for the IEPs to get information about forecasting. So what, what way can we encourage greater uh, cooperation and awareness of, of uh, what the potential uh, will be uh, you know, a month from now uh, for, for your company to, to maximize uh, their assets uh, appropriately and and so uh, I am when I look at these uh, agreements right now these these uh, uh, pooling agreements uh, they don't seem to give uh, enough ability for the equipment providers to be more informed and so what's what's your thoughts on a way to to, to get more uh, transparency uh, uh, in the front of the transaction for your company well, you know, interestingly, um, every ocean carrier that calls in Southern California, as an example, um, is required in other places on the planet to provide information in a certain way at a certain time. Uh, and if not provided in some places, your ship doesn't get work. Uh, if the quality of the information is problematic, uh, you, you pay. If your feeder connectivity is not provided within a certain time, you pay. Um, so they're used to providing data. You know, providing the data is not a problem. They have the data. Uh, providing the data in a common form is not a problem. They're used to doing that. The port authorities in the U.S. have a, are, are, are really the vehicle for requiring information, not just on a voluntary basis, but on a, on a requirement. You will give it to us this way, in this format, at this time, uh, and use that as the basis of getting at the information, right? The, well, you can provide it or don't, depending on, uh, on, on how you choose. Well, it's easy enough to sweep that away. They, they're required to do this in other places, right? This is, this is not unique. So requiring carriers to provide certain information at a certain time, requiring terminal operators to make certain information available. The port authority is the one who has a relationship, who has the hammer to be able to require information. Uh, so they've, they've you know, the, the vehicle exists uh, to be able to do that, to improve the quality of the information that's coming. Um, but let, let me kind of loop back also to, to GPS. <clears throat> um, GPS has application for a, a subset of the market. Um, uh, there are some customers that value it, uh, and the economics of having valued it uh, makes sense uh, for the investment. Uh, the market broadly doesn't, uh, and the economics of the doing, um, whether the terminal operator is using the assets for his own convenience or whether they're available or not, GPS is not going to solve that problem, uh, as an example. Uh, same thing at rail ramps. Um, just simply the breadcrumb trail of a GPS has limited utility relative to the nature of the problems that are, are being addressed. And in pools, uh, not, not really an application. You know, the, the, the problem is, you know, it's not that we don't know where it is. You know, we know the customer that took it. The EDI may be late in, in getting it. Uh, it may be bad data that requires being cleaned up. But to my earlier comment, there's technology that exists that is employed in other places in the world that allows you to capture that information on a very high level of accuracy that eliminates that problem. That would have a bigger impact than running out and putting GPS on a bunch of pool chassis. I'd love to, to, uh, to have the, uh, 
uh, follow up on that. Uh, I, I'm not wedded to a particular type of technology, just information on status. Uh, I will give you an example. I was in the Pacific Northwest uh, and I went to uh, one of the ports there. I'm not gonna uh, na give names, but, but uh, there was uh, 20, a huge acreage, an amount of acreage that had been uh, conveyed to a private uh, entity and they were parking uh, uh, individual boxes on chassis right out there. Uh, and there was huge, uh, huge field of that. And that of course is their prerogative, um, but, the end result was it took a huge amount of chassis out of utilization for the duration of whatever they're storing that uh, container. In this case, it was something that was not perishable. It was something that could have been stacked and, and moved. So they're using your chassis, uh, all of the of the company's chassis to uh, to store cargo, and they're paying a per diem. And 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 if you got a bunch of furniture, that it, it goes for. A thousand dollars a box now because you have to assemble everything. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it doesn't bother you. Um, uh, so, so, uh, so I, it, you know, I, I do think we need a greater awareness of this uh, of this sort of status because as we've as the economy has been constrained by movement, um, uh, pricing and transportation really hasn't been an issue. It's been the fact that we're not getting certain commodities moved, uh, you know, that components are not being delivered. So I think this um, the requirement to be aware of where uh, of, of, of equipment like uh, intermodal chassis is something that if we don't do, uh, uh, we're not going to overcome uh, uh, the challenges of, uh, of, of congestion. Uh, perhaps maybe we can work our way through it, but, but uh, but I do think we need to know uh, the status of, of, of equipment that's been held out there for 15 days. And, and I don't know what the answer is, but, but uh, so I'd be very interested in following up on the uh, technologies used in, in foreign countries because I am not wedded and we're not going to be looking at a particular type of technology. We're looking purely at data. We're looking at uh, uh, information that should be provided, when it should be provided. And status, and status is is uh, if it's not moving, why is it not moving, and is there a way to get it moving? Uh, and so that's uh, that's uh, something that I'd love to hear. Um, and it, it may be penalties, you know. It may be if, if you keep a, a chassis from moving after uh, for ten or fifteen days, there should be something that that could be done. We do have limits. This is a constrained environment uh, because uh, right now, 85% uh, of the world's SEs are made in China. Um, and uh, um, they and were. They yeah, were. <laughs> they were, they were. Uh, and, and they manufacture 100% of the marine containers. And from a large, and I know there are issues related to this market and it being constrained now and problems created by it, but from a larger policy perspective, it's offensive to me that that we're stuck in a situation where we're completely reliant on the Chinese government's manufacture of things. And so I know uh, uh, that this is a challenge, but how are you, what steps are you taking to, to deal with this? I, I know that there's companies that are uh, uh, starting, I, I think it was uh, uh, one of the uh, pools, uh, NED, uh, PCP uh, um, uh, purchased, uh, uh, Pratt Industries, I think. What, how is how are you all dealing with a constrained uh, manufacturing uh, environment to try to get more equipment moving to places where it needs to move? Well, we've uh, we've 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 added uh, about ten percent uh, to our fleet in terms of deployed uh, assets, combination of new builds uh, and uh, and some refurbs uh, last year. Uh, our fleet will grow uh, by a bit over 10% uh, this year, um, but that's only 10% because that's all that's available. Uh, so, you know, production capacity is, uh, is not going to meet market demand for some time. I don't know, maybe 2023. Uh, I, I don't know. 
uh, you know, the same the same guy that's building the marine chassis is building domestic chassis, uh, <laughs> and uh, so you know the overall demand uh, uh, is a, a little difficult to get your arms around. But it looks like that uh, process is going to be uh, a long time in uh, in reaching sufficient production to be able to meet market demand. Yeah, I mean, same for us. I mean, like we we're going to grow. We grew last year. We're going to grow again this year. Similar numbers. And the answer is we're spending more money. You know, like that. Like yeah, it's costing more. You know, because it's it's more expensive, and you got to use you know um, more providers. You and um, you know, you got to spread it around. And, and to be honest with you, Commissioner, it's a real challenge. You know, like it, it's, it, I wish I could tell you that the market had corrected and that, 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 that we we're able to meet demand. But to Ron's point, you know, it's a bit like trying to supply Walmart from a 7 Eleven at the moment. Like that's literally the best analogy I can come up with. So, you know, everyone's working very hard and, and doing everything they can. I mean, we've entered into um, a number of arrangements with third party providers where we get, you know, um, you know, um, we get first rider refusal on all their production stuff. It doesn't come for free. So, you know, we just, it's the investment case uh, at the moment. And, and you know, we're, we're putting more money into it. Mike? I would just say, you know, we are putting more resources into identifying and working with suppliers to get new chassis in the door as I, we ever have. And, and we're okay. prepared to make the largest investments we ever have this year and, and potentially next depending on how long it takes for that production to ramp up. So I, I, I think it was Ron who, who brought up the issue of, of the amount of time it spent, uh, your, your company spends processing information that comes in an EDI. Um, uh, I, I, and it sounds, just uh, talking to all three of you, that there's an inordinate of, uh, amount of time that's spent uh, sorting through different data sources uh, to try to uh, to uh, to reconcile it, it's almost like an intelligence network that you're running. How many people do you of your total like you know people do you have to do uh, based uh, uh, use to sort of assess the information that you collect? It seems like it's it's a higher percentage that you would than you would see in other industries just by nature of the different people you have to deal with and the complexity of the of the market, but also with the complexity of, of it and differences of information. So uh, Ron, why don't you start up with that? Yeah, well, um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're blessed uh, to a degree uh, with probably, you know, we're, we're, the, we're the smallest provider of assets into pools, uh, great pools in particular, uh, which are the, uh, the primary uh, source of our, uh, of our angst. Uh, you know, we've got, uh, you know, we've probably got 10% of our, uh, our headcount is involved in some way uh, with, uh, you know, data cleansing, uh, you know, uh, largely EDI related uh, uh, in, uh, in nature. Don't you think that's sort of high uh, percentage? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Okay. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's wasteful. Uh, and, uh, and of course, that, uh, that has uh, that has uh, an impact on our customers, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. so our, our ability to send a customer a bill that's right, uh, right the first time, uh, is uh, is made challenging as a result of that. Sending a bill timely uh, is uh, uh, is a factor, uh, and uh, you know the uh, the pools are the uh, the the uh, the largest area of challenge in that respect. So I'm going to cut in here. Uh, we're past four o'clock. And uh, I promised everybody yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'd be done by four. Well, well let's do, uh, we'll do, let Mike and, and Dan, Dan finish up and then we'll, we'll gavel it close there. I don't want to be unfair, so. Yeah, look, thanks, Michelle. I mean, I, I would agree with Ron, you know, to the specific questions about um, about 10% and, and yeah, it is inefficient. And just if a quick closing comment, you know, I just want to thank uh, all my uh, colleagues here, industry colleagues and everyone in the industry. I always say this, Commissioner, every time I see you, but, you know, I mean, the volumes are up 50%. Christmas wasn't cancelled in the end. People down there <laughs> working their socks off. You know, I want to say thank you to everybody that's out there turning up to work every day and moving the stuff along. Mike, you want to make a closing either in response or a uh, 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 closing yeah. comment? I, I would say, um, you know, very similar to what both Ron and Dan said in terms of the importance of 
uh, people managing data, along with maintenance and repair of the assets and logistics and, you know, a number of other key capabilities, if you will. Um, but I would just echo what Dan said in terms of, you know, it's been really uh, challenging, but also amazing to watch the way folks across the supply chain have come together uh, throughout the pandemic, and, and we'll, we'll continue doing it. I mean, we will stay focused on bringing in new assets and serving customers in every way we can. So we appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would just say uh, I was looking at uh, uh, the CARES package uh, of assistance that was provided to, to various industries, and the maritime industry has moved record numbers of cargo in the last two-year period during COVID when people were getting sick. And I, I talked to the West Coast. They said uh, they're 10% depleted workforce right now, but they're still handling more cargo than ever before. Uh, and it's a testament to your companies and to the industry. Uh, uh, ironically, the federal government uh, appropriated $110 billion uh, uh, to support uh, uh, the aviation industry and the transit industry, which were mostly idled in the early part and have, uh, well, while they've come back are probably 70% down in total uh, uh, departures. Um, and they gave the maritime industry, which has been sustaining uh, uh, the country's movement, uh, $4.1 million. Uh, I think it's less than 0.04% of the total funding uh, so uh, the industry has done a magnificent job, and so we have to uh, we have to 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 credit them uh, for that. But but we also probably need to think of what the new reality is, uh, and that's why we're doing this on on data. So I wanted to thank all of you uh, for participating. Uh, it was uh, uh, thoughtful, and we'll be back in contact. Uh, uh, hopefully. Uh, uh, we, we're working towards a, a data summit, so I would hope that you could send someone, uh, participate yourselves or send someone to participate because we really need uh, the chassis IEP industry uh, active on this because it really is critical uh, a part of the transportation chain. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, I think we're going to close it for today. Uh, again, we'll be back in contact and, uh, and, uh, and appreciate all your efforts in this. Thank you.